Okay. Uh, so Chris Berg is responsible for product strategy. It's one of well-known decision management vendor in rural technology. And Chris already presented several times at decision camps previously. And I noticed that he always starts his presentations with the word good beginnings. So Chris, I hope you will explain why you do this. Good luck. Thank you, thank you, and uh, it, it's great to be here, um, Jacob. I just want to say I've been really impressed with the the content here at Decision Camp. It's some really good uh, presentations, so happy mm -hmm. to be here. Um, so, why do we start with good beginnings? Why do we do this? Well, uh, for the past several years, I've been listening to customers. Uh, and prospects and the ins and outs of their projects and what really helps them and what gets in the way with their projects. And while we have a lot of technology at our disposal and many of us are excited about DMN and the standards that are the changes to the standards that are coming down the pike, um, you know, at the end of the day, what's really getting in the way of projects may have nothing to do with the technology at all. In fact, it's the social interactions that we have on the team that, that are getting in the way uh, of our success. So while we have the great technology, if we're not thinking about this in the right way together, uh, things just don't happen the way that we need them to. And last year, we were talking about good beginnings um, where we were focused on problem discovery and stating goals. So there, there's always that point of view. Uh, I think Sandy said this at the end of last year's presentation. It's not about uh, doing the thing right. It's making sure you're working on the right thing. Uh, and that's absolutely what Good Beginnings is about, is that those activities and those practices that we're working on today that really drive us to the end of the project. But it's interesting that we're talking about sustainability at the same time that we're talking about the beginning, because the seeds of our success are always there uh, at the very beginning. And how do we get to sustainable automation? How do we get to a program that is, is really rinse and repeat? Are we really aware of the things that are making us successful? Are we really stating back to the business the impact that we want to make? And is that going to propel us and create the trust that we need to get to the next project? Because if we're just going to do this again, if we're just going to do what code used to do, if we're just going to uh, lower that horizon, we're never going to get to those exceptional results that drive, uh, that drive the business and, and drive growth and, and innovation. So in a way, when we're thinking about our investments in automation and the spend that's going to take place, we're really starting an engine of innovation uh, within the organization. And so how do we get to that success and how do we state back to the business that the investment they've made is really driving, uh, driving us forward? So that's what we mean by sustainability is that whole end-to-end -end delivery through the eyes and frame of a program that's going to take us to where we want to go. And um, so I'm going to back up just a little bit. Uh, and for those that uh, may not have seen uh, last year's presentation, but what's really important about any program is where we start and where teams feel uh, or the anxiety they feel about what's unknown or what could go wrong. Um, and usually the things that folks are feeling on the team is focused around things they're familiar with, things that have caught them in the past. So the developers and the architects are thinking, well, integration is our biggest risk. We don't know those APIs. We don't know how this is all going to get put together. And so integration is often stated as one of the biggest risks. And, you know, we've got to mitigate that early. And while that might be true, um, you know, we have to assume that when a vendor says they have an API, they have an API and it can hook up to something. But what is more subtle often are the risks that aren't talked about, the risks that aren't felt by the team members, and therefore they never make it to an explicit 
action point to really think through, do we have everything we need to start this project? Are we on the right problem? Do we all know what the goals are? Are we sure that we know what kind of funding that we have? And, and the people that are on the team, how well aligned are they? Because it's one thing to have uh, a name on a list of folks that might be able to do something, but have we really secured them on the schedule? Are they really ready to work on this project? Or are they afraid of working? Have we really got the emotional uh, temperature of the people that are about to work on this project? And what assumptions that we have, if proven true or false, could make or break? this project. So these assumptions are, are really important. Uh, and as we talk about engagement with business users, uh, we just had in the previous session a discussion of low code. What do people like and hate? Well, what about what do people fear? What do people fear and what are they looking forward to? Because sometimes the business folks, when they have to touch something, they are afraid uh, to touch something if they don't have the right support. So how do we connect with the team at an emotional level? And as we move through these initial risks, when we bootstrap a team, that's when we move into the, the next part of the project. How do we integrate? How do we really uh, come to terms with the skills that we need? And as we move into the build phase, things really, really take off. But sustainability isn't just about making sure that we bootstrap this team correctly, that we're all pointing to the North Star, that we all understand it, but it's really taking that longer look across the entire cycle of the project and asking ourselves, did we do everything that we could to get us to the second project? Have we built enough trust with the business to do this again? Uh, and what is our funding going to look like for next year? Uh, based on this success. And, and once we get to go live, are they going to keep funding the things that we need that are still in the backlog? Because at the end of the day, you, you deliver a project, teams are really hesitant to overinvest one way or the other. But when we look at the backlog, there's typically all kinds of things that are not done. Uh, improvements that can be made, maybe future experiments that need to happen. And how is the team going to talk about that with the business in a way that keeps uh, keeps that spend going? And that's that's really what we're what we're focused on. Now, last year we talked about um, a readiness checklist. I love checklists because they help us orient and ask questions uh, to ourselves. Sometimes uh, we're not always honest with ourselves about the preparation that we've done. So going through a readiness checklist just helps baseline the team. Did we think of everything? Do we know who the leadership is, who our sponsors are, who are our key stakeholders, and what do they care about? Um, and how are we going to recruit the team members? Who do we think can write these rules or, you know, work on these decisions or create these machine learning models? Now as the footprint, you know, as we start to ask the question fundamentally, uh, how are we going to expand the scope of our decisioning to now include machine learning models or even optimization? Now we're crossing pretty significant boundaries of skill sets to pull all this together. So do we really have uh, the people that we need? And, and not incidentally, are the people we recruiting, uh, do they know to talk the same way to the business. So then we might have people that are really good at creating machine learning models and might be really poor uh, or unpracticed at saying what the impact of the business would be or operationalizing that decision inside of other decisions. So how can we support the team to really bring their skills all together and, and drive uh, success? So this is a case, this, um, the, this checklist, if you will, we go through the we have done this with customers. We get them all together and, and we talk about, you know, what we're going to do together. Well, last year we talked a little bit about agreeing on the problem and how important that is, making sure we're on the best problem, the problem that gets to the best outcome uh, for the organization and orient everyone towards that as a North Star. Because 
what we learned, uh, what we learn continually when we get people together is they're all looking at a different star and, and, and we have to quickly baseline everybody on, on what we're going to do. So once we've done that work and, and I won't go into too much more detail from last year, but once we've oriented the team, we've all written a problem statement together. We've all thought about what we're going to do in the time frame. It really helps us, um, move quickly uh, to what we're going to do. So we're not going to suffer from losing our way. Uh, we're going to know everything that we're doing is, is worth doing. Now, as a step beyond, uh, as a step beyond just orienting the team and making sure that the team uh, can get agreement and do some practices that get us all in place, we can start to apply other checklists that go through all the dimensions of a project that are going to take us from day one to go live. And we're going to need a lot of activities to get us going. So in the early dimension, we've got problem discovery. That's this area here in green. And this is where we're doing those larger exercises. We're bootstrapping the team. We're journey mapping. We're looking at assumptions, creating hypotheses. We're going to storyboard uh, or journey map quite a few things together as we orient them. And then like a funnel, uh, we're going to move them, move the team into more concrete kinds of activities. What data models do we have? Do we have to do some conceptual modeling? And then we move them into the things which everybody uh, is ready to do. Let's make something. Let's build something. So I'm not going to spend as much time on the operational models. But coming out of the creating a good model and creating good decisions, uh, there's how are we going to live with it? And lifecycle management is as important to the success of a project as everything else, because once we have delivered, once we're go live, we can't keep doing things from uh, a manual point of view. Things need to be automated. The team needs to be aware of what's going on and what that change looks like. And, and ultimately, uh, the team really needs to think um, probably as aggressively about how they're going to live with something as much as they have put into the operational aspects uh, of what they're doing. Because we could lose our way again if our life cycle isn't thought through. Our machine learning models can drift. Our decisions may not be that effective or over time the decisions themselves start to bloat or suffer from other kinds of problems where uh, the team hasn't hasn't addressed certain kinds of practices. So life cycle is really critical. And then finally, what are the things that are the team, you know, what are the things the team is going to do together? What kind of improvement can we get? Uh, how are we going to test the very things that we've created? How do we know when we're worse or better? Um, and what kind of experiments should we be running to prove our business case back to the folks uh, that are responsible for the spend on the team? So these are all really, really critical areas. We're just going to go through some of these. A couple I'm going to hit. Um, uh, a couple I'm going to hit more concretely because they they really have an impact on the downstream side of the project when we're going after sustainability. But along the way, we're also going to talk about recipes. And recipes, I believe, are a really easy way for everyone to think about how our business problem is going to slice through these dimensions. And recipes are just simply asking the question, what do we need? What do we need here for this project? Do we need everything or can we get by with just a little bit as we move our project through and we start checking the boxes about, did we do this? Did we do this activity? Did we think about these problems? So on and so forth. But before we get into recipes, let's just take a look at some of the models and some of the things that we can um, orient around as we go through these these dimensions. So this is a, an example I used from last year. Uh, this is an example of a journey map that we did with um, a customer that manage, uh, manages uh, national fleets of vehicles. 
And I want to spend a little more time on this. Um, I know I did this last year, but I think it's really critical to make the connection from what's going on here to what's going to happen later on um, in, in as we as we get towards go live and how important these early discoveries are to sustainability. So at the very beginning, this company knew that they had a problem. They were getting nine to 11 million calls a year into the call center, which is a lot. And they had done some preliminary work. Most everybody in the company knew the top five reasons for most of the calls. And, and they had landed on, we're getting a lot of uh, calls in to order a fuel card. And we were able to, to do, um, um, we we're able to do a workshop uh, with the team and just go through quickly without doing a lot of research. This was off the top of their head. Everyone had a lot of information. We knew all the reasons why people were calling in. And we started to diagram around this. And we also then started mapping out, well, what really happens there? How, how do we think about this from a time point of view? And as we did this, you know, how did the problem start? How do they call in? Uh, who's acting on their behalf. So a call center person is acting as a proxy. And along the way, we learned that there's some candidate decisions in here. Candidate decisions to figure out what should we do? How do we pre-process what's about to happen? And there is another candidate decision around delivery and shipping. And I was surprised, <laughs> honestly, I was surprised about the complexity of shipping details because I didn't realize just how impactful shipping would be um, in terms of costs, um, delivery, uh, and other constraints that really feed back to the way the business was thinking about this. And then finally, uh, as um, fuel cards are reordered, things fire off in, into nothing, into air, because the, this team didn't have any awareness after a fuel card was reordered, if it was ever received. Uh, and so the absence of information became really critical uh, for this team that they would ha start having notifications. And of course, if no one is aware that a reorder had occurred, this is where re-entrance or recurrence was occurring. So they would call in again to the call center. It's bad enough that we're getting one call, but now we're getting multiples. And, and then we, you know, we asked the team, uh, just go through the things that we really care about. What opportunities uh, would we like to go after that we've never been able to, to go after before? And I, I think this is really important. The team could have just said, let's just do the minimum and, and get by. Uh, let's just make it work and then move from there. But without asking the question about what could we do better with the spend that we have, what could we do that would make this exceptional? Just asking the question, I think is important for the team. Not that they're gonna overspend or that they're going to be late because they've added scope, but they're just simply asking the question, what if the world wasn't like this? What if the world was better? And with that case in mind, with that lens, we're able to really think through, well, Let's just see if we can reduce call volumes in the time that we are running. Um, and the team decided this was going to be a mobile app. Uh, technology choices hadn't really gone beyond that. It, it, they could have decided that they wanted some other form of self-service, but they decided to go down this road. So they wanted to see if the mobile app could allow a driver to reorder a card. Would it lower the call volume? Let's track that. Let's also track some cycle time for the things that we can control. And let's also track those failed activation rates. Let's just play with that a little bit and see if we can get that improvement. So already the team is thinking about what we're gonna do um, and, and what the impact would be, what is the goal? Because if, if we take the, these actions, and call volumes don't go down or we haven't impacted the reactivation rate, we, we've got to change. We've got to do, you've got to do something else. And so the team was very oriented, very motivated. Um, and, and what really got them excited was the fact that they might be able to solve problems with, with the same effort that they've never 
been able to solve before. So problem discovery and having alignment with the team there is just really important. And as we move from that model into discovery models, these things that help us um, figure out more concretely, what do we need for a decision? What other conceptual, how do we want to think about of our, uh, how do we want to think about uh, our data? Uh, and, you know, we might have a just a simple conceptual model for the data. We might start moving into a more concrete data model. But really, the team is just thinking, how do we go from what we've just talked about here to, to things that we can assign to people, assign things to people where they could be more um, uh, research oriented and bring back that information into the team before we talk about requirements. Because by the time we get here into the operational models, and you know these are the things that everyone um, you know will spend a lot of their time doing and implementing, uh, what we really need to do is uh, just keep the team moving. Now, um, the elephant in the room here is is that I I didn't list out requirements. <laughs> where where do requirements fit in, in all of this and Really, requirements, in my view, are, are uh, heavily oriented towards the operational artifacts that you need to create your decisions, but they're really betwixt and between. They're really in between a lot of these dimensions because as we're moving through these phases, we are actively gathering requirements, different kinds of requirements, requirements at different levels before they become so concrete and specific uh, that we can test that they're true or false, that the decision is making the eligibility decision or that it's finding fraud or it's detecting uh, other things that we want uh, for our project. So um, we really need to be thinking how these uh, different dimensions are connecting. And at the same time, we're able to ask some of the skills questions who on the team can handle this model, this DMN model, who can handle a conceptual model, who can handle a data model, who's the best person to think about uh, hardening uh, that data uh, before we're bringing it into the project. And later when we get into some recipes, we'll, we'll get some concrete examples about how that exercise can really impact the success of the team. If there isn't anyone there that, um, can handle those problems and and help um, you know integrate that in into the solution in a way that really matters. And then finally, there's or um, then there's the um, life cycle management. And uh, really, here there's so much going on. Um, Prior to COVID, a lot of teams were in war rooms. Uh, they, uh, you know, they they gather together. They're next to each other. I'm making a change. Oh, okay. Well, uh, during COVID, a lot of people were working from home, and they weren't able to do that. And so now we're separated, but still need that real time awareness of what's going on with our life cycle. And rather than waiting until uh, the end of the project, oh, we, you know, we, we've got to automate this. Wouldn't it be better to think more concretely, um, you know, let's do this from the beginning. Let's just take our production change process and do it from the very beginning so that by the time we get to production, there's no change in what we're doing. Let's just do it uh, this way. Let's just keep everyone aware. Let's get our pipelines in place. Let's auto deploy. Let's get our approvals together uh, as we go between environments. Uh, let's figure out how we want to deploy our machine learning models. Uh, you know, when do we detect for drift? Uh, and do we get that going sooner rather than later? Um, you know, the team really does have some choices to make. It's not that we have to do everything all at once, but we do need to think about who can do what and, and how can we get this life cycle working so the team isn't pulled down uh, through manual activities, but these this automation is going to lift them up and and help them scale. 
Um, so while the funding is really good, maybe during the first part of the year, maybe they're going to have more people than they'll have on year two, year three. This automation is what's really going to help them get into that sustainable type of activity so that they're spending less time on being aware of the change in, across the life cycle and they're spending more time with the people they have on, on bigger business problems, bigger business value. And then finally, it's really um, putting it together to demonstrate to the business that we have the improvement that we want. We're getting the call volumes that we want. Reorders are down for this month. And maybe there have been some escalations. Maybe the team is adding information here. But it's not enough to just think about these dashboards for the team as things that are constrained to the data that's flowing through the automation that, that we've had. This data is going to connect to lots of things and lots of other data sources because we, we need it. We need to understand um, how it connects to other concepts through, you know, in the business um, to really understand uh, the impact. And so the team, I think, really needs to connect the dots here uh, with their activities. So uh, everyone should be aware while the project is underway, um, you, you know, what's really happening. And as we approach, um, as we approach go live, maybe the team is able to just demonstrate a dashboard that says, hey, we're better than we were um, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, because we ran some simulations. And even though we're not running live data, we've run some synthetic data through the things that we're doing. And yeah, we think we're, we think we're on, we're on our way. Uh, but this is what is, is going to demonstrate to leadership that the spend uh, is, is, is in the right direction for what the team is doing. Well, it's it's just a really nice cross section going through, um, you know, all the dimensions. Thinking about these from uh, from a checklist point of view. But let's take let's take a more concrete view of what this looks like in a real project. Let, let's take for example customer churn. Uh, there's lots of reasons why customers might churn, uh, and similar to whoever is, has studied the problem within the company or they've talked about it, um, there's probably a lot of anecdotal data about how churn might be occurring. So whether I am a, um, an internet service provider or I am a loan servicer, churn has different, um, you know, different data uh, by industry, but the problems are very similar and somebody has to look at all the reasons why that churn is, is occurring. And often it's very, very segmented. And so someone just really has to say, you know, here's the percentage of folks that are going to leave for these reasons, for these factors, and, and really help everyone understand what are we going to go after with churn and uh, what kind of program are we going to run uh, with this? Um, someone is going to have to get very concrete with uh, the data, the data relationships. Uh, they may be creating models simply for the effect of segmenting all the churn profiles that are required for this. So we're going to need someone pretty quickly on the team that knows their way around analytics and machine learning. Um, we're probably going to need some additional data in order to make this work. So let's say I'm looking, I'm a, a loan servicer and I want to look at my churn uh, probabilities, but I may need a lot more data than I have. I may have to pull in a national data set. I may have to understand uh, loan values or, or, or property values. I may be looking for uh, other propensities that are gonna drive, um, that are gonna drive this program. And then we need to start mapping uh, whatever it is that we are detecting into operational decisions. So we're going to have to put a program together. We're going to have to um, really think about eligibility in a way that makes sense. And then we're going to have to just set it all up with a life cycle. And churn often lends itself to batch processing. So now suddenly, well, where are we going to batch process? Well, we need some. A, 
do we need a data platform? Can we use what we have? Um, how do we hook up DevOps to push our decisions out? Uh, let's say, for example, uh, that in order to process for churn, uh, we need to upload into Hadoop and Spark. Um, you know, can we push our decisions out there? Can we, um, you know, hook this all up? So the team is again going through the checklist. Do we have people that know this? Um, and how are we how are we going to fund uh, the right kinds of people uh, for our success? And then finally, we've got to rinse and repeat on the dashboards, challenge ourselves to improve, and and really deliver. Uh, things to our stakeholders, maybe even automate the delivery of our dashboards right into their inbox so they can understand uh, how our how our churn models are working, how our decisions are working, and and fulfilling uh, those the the programs to convert people from from a churn risk uh, to a new kind of opportunity. So that's kind of a high level point of view as we go through all um, all these recipes. Uh, another recipe might be call center mortgage pre-qualification. So customers are calling into a call center. They could be having uh, preliminary discussions about a kind of loan or what their goals are uh, for a loan. And as they're being evaluated in on, on the call, uh, customers may be having problems with converting folks uh, reliably uh, to a loan product and, and starting a loan application. In other cases, they may not even be aware uh, when they've crossed the line between just talking about a loan and where their compliance requirements are for truth and lending. So they've got to balance a lot going on here. They've got to have a conversation that's not disruptive. They need to be asking critical questions about, well, what are you trying to do? What's the purpose of your loan? And they have to do this in a kind of natural way. And they don't want to, you know, suffer the their prospect with a death by questions. I mean, even if they did have a, a dynamic questionnaire going, how can they be more intelligent about the questions they ask? Can they be more pointed to get them uh, interested in starting a loan application? So how can we help them? Uh, with this recipe? What kind of research could we do with the team? And it, similar to everything else, uh, they can workshop together, they can start doing their research, can start looking at um, trying to discover uh, the data that we need to really improve that experience. They're going to need someone on the team that knows something about compliance. Uh, and there's a lot of folks in our space that have done great work with decisioning. They've worked uh, across industries, but the second they land uh, into a, a industry that's regulated, uh, the things that they know um, from their previous work just um, aren't as, um, uh, they're not able to get over the hump uh, of the compliance requirements in a, in a decision. So they really need someone on the team that just cold knows lending and knows the the problem deeply and they can't rely on folks that have done a lot of decisioning they need that SME to really guide them and from there it's it's kind of rinse and repeat right it's getting the decisions together hooking that up to whatever technology they're using for their q a and then they're um they're thinking about um getting their machine learning models together and bringing more people together uh, to this team to, to drive what they want to do. Uh, I won't go into the rest of these, but I think you can start to see how each different kind of problem brings in different data, brings in different team members, uh, and really helps them think about who do we need to be successful what do we need to be successful? And this could start off a lot of other questions, recruiting, hiring, finding consultants, bringing in the people uh, that we need and, cover, and covering the gaps to make us successful. Because folks, if we don't do this, if the team does not do this at the very beginning, uh, and if we're not analyzing why we were successful in previous projects, it'll be, shocking to us when we get to a new project and we're not successful. 
Um, and oftentimes, we don't realize that our success came from something we did naturally uh, previously. And so we never, we never thought about it. You know, we didn't think about the alignment of skills, people, uh, salaries, uh, the leadership characteristics on the team that really drove something else to, to completion. So these checklists can help, um, but they're just uh, a way to get us thinking about what our success will really look like and who needs to be on the bus to pull this off. Now, what I think is interesting is that as we go through these recipes, uh, we don't need everything. Uh, and it depends on the, the business problem. And so I've been doing a lot of work with folks at uh, decisionautomation.org. And one of our objectives with, uh, with this organization is to drive the adoption of DMN. Uh, and while we're supporting um, uh, the efforts with OMG on the standard simply by promoting it, we're doing so by drawing a bigger picture around uh, the problem space. So it's not enough to say, well, you know, you need all of this DMN, all or nothing to solve a problem. But the, the truth of it is, if, if you have limited scope or you're just going to do something, you don't need everything in the specification to be successful. Or you need a lot more things that aren't in the specification at all. And so using these recipes are really helpful uh, to think about things outside of the specification that are an absolute must. Now, what I'm talking about here is beyond the scope of, um, is a much larger scope than what we're focused on right now at decisionautomation.org. But we are thinking very concretely in terms of scenarios and how specific parts of the standard fit with these scenarios. And we're hoping that folks will really start to understand, um, uh, you know, this is what this is what's necessary from that standard. Now, one of the scenarios that has come up a lot in our discussions is decision inventory. Um, and so one of our, one of our members, uh, Jan Purchase, uh, he has thought a lot about this and there's other members on the team, uh, Ryan Trollop. Uh, I, some of them were supposed to be um, uh, live on the session. So if you have questions about decision inventory, as I'm talking about this, they, they're they more than happy to, uh, to chime in on what that is. But basically, uh, there are organizations that want to do research around the automation that's already existing, whether it's manual, in code. Really, it's like What's our state of automation across the organization and what kinds of automation opportunities are there when we're done uh, that we can improve on, draft on existing successes, or make some new investments that really will be a game changer for the organization. So this decision inventory, you don't need to go beyond problem discovery, look, doing some journey mapping, researching with people and doing some basic diagramming uh, with DMN uh, just to try and articulate the things that we are discovering and use those models as a way to plan and, and forecast and prioritize work back into, back into the IT organization. So uh, I'm really excited about this because the emphasis is really on dis, um, um, using the discovery aspects of these dimensions to solve a really hard business problem, getting that visibility across the organization. And that can really kickstart uh, just having a summary of that can really kickstart uh, a lot of interesting discussions. So recipes, uh, they're really important, I think, as a checklist that's going to help us inventory what we need, get the alignment that we need, make sure budgeting is aligned with the things that we want to do. It sets us up for reporting, uh, strategy activities, and, and completing the business case. So all of which are gonna help us get to a point of sustainability. And along the way, there's always challenges. There's always things that get in the way. Uh, folks are worried, well, if, if we do this, is it gonna blow up our scope? 
uh, is this going to cause harm? Um, obviously, if you're going to do an activity with the team and it's unnecessary, uh, you know, should we be doing that? Um, do we need to be thinking about um, implementation right now? Can we postpone that? Uh, or if, you know, some IT folks are just very reticent about keeping the lights on and not thinking too far beyond what has been accomplished previously. Uh, and the team has to really think about where those gravitational parts are in the organization, the, the risk versus opportunity, uh, and really get a feel for how much cultural change is that organization ready to take on if we go too far on the automation front. But we won't know until we start driving that into the business and asking them how much greater is our revenue opportunity here or how much more operational efficiency are we going to achieve with the activities that we have in place. And so at the end of the day, it, it always comes back to this. It really comes back to closing the year with metrics. And when we talk about how to keep your innovation engine going, how to build trust in the organization for the work that's taking place. It's really right here. So at the end of the year, it's not enough to talk about what everybody did. Everybody worked really hard. Uh, let's assume that they wouldn't be here or they'd be on their way out if they weren't working hard already. But what is important is the impact that we had. And it doesn't take a lot of information. It could literally be the last dashboard that went out uh, at the end of the year, and it just says this is what impact we had, or maybe someone can take those numbers and and translate that into salaries, translate that into other kinds of budgetary um, numbers that that make sense. But I think everyone will get uh, that people equal expense in the organization or. Um, orders, more orders equal more opportunity, more revenue, less churn equals, um, you know, things that we all care about. So this is really, really important. And I, I literally <laughs> just had a conversation with, with a customer. Uh, their organization had just laid off uh, thousands of employees. And, uh, you know, the question was, um, you know, we're, we're really worried of, about what's going on uh, in the economy. And right in the middle of this, uh, I asked the question, well, doesn't that mean that the opportunities now are more important than ever, ever to turn every opportunity into, um, you know, into some kind of revenue generation or uh, go after operational efficiencies that we couldn't achieve before? So rather than focusing on the cost of something, rather than focusing on the cost of what's going on with a specific vendor or a specific piece of technology, shouldn't we be oriented towards something that really matters? And, um, and his response to me was simply, IT was receiving funding, uh, whatever they wanted. Uh, they really didn't have to connect the dots between their funding and their impact to the organization. Now, they have different, obviously, like a lot of organizations, they have enterprise architects and they have folks that think strategically. But the actual IT organization wasn't, they just didn't have a well-developed muscle to connect the dots between their spend and their impact. Um, and so if we're going to really build the trust that we need as practitioners. Uh, you know, my challenge to everyone is to really think about this and think about the projects that you've had. Think about checklists. I'm just starting to write about this, um, you know, from a, a repeatable point of view, but I challenge everyone to think about their own recipes and think about how they've been successful and, and how they got to those points and share them. Uh, because if we're going to make the change in the world that we expect, if we're going to lift up every project, if we're going to support 
uh, the DMN activities that many of us care about. These are the things that are going to really matter. The technology has to be sound, but those of us that are in the trenches, we, we have to help everyone along the way. Thank you. Chris, thanks. That was great. I'm really loving the theme of today where a lot of the sessions are about, you know, not just focused on decisions and, and rules, but on how do we make these things more successful? How do we make the, the projects that we're doing more successful? And I think that that is ultimately important. There's lessons to be learned in what you've said and what other people have said across various types of, of IT projects, not just decision-based ones, but you know, definitely looking at, at how we can how we can make those those work. Um, just before we get started on the Q&A, I just want to see if Rob Parker, if you are online, I do see you on Zoom, but I didn't get a chat message from you. If you can just send me a direct chat because we'll need to get you set up um, to start your presentation for the last one of the day at the top of the hour. Now, Chris, um, Jacob had a question about the, the same one that he asked to Gregor. What's your estimate of the actual percentage of in rules customer cases that are using machine learning and rules together? Well, I think everyone is aware that we, um, our machine learning capability was through through an acquisition, and so uh, we're we're in you know we're still in the process of combining everything with with our customers and bringing everything together. So I don't think that our um, um, the future state will be different from current state, I think is the best way to say that. Um, but I will say this uh, strategically, uh, what's important is that a lot of machine learning problems surface in just about every kind of decision that and they're avoided in a lot of cases because it seems hard um, or uh, it, it, it has an extra lift to it that people might not be ready for. So it really depends on where uh, customers are in their own journeys. Obviously, as you go up the continuum to customers that have, all, have a long history of doing machine learning, um, they've been doing things on their own for a while and competing very well. So regardless of, um, uh, of you know, what we are doing as, as a vendor, and we're joining, you know, we're able to join those conversations in a way that we haven't been able to. So it's really, um, I think it's a really interesting question. And I think that question needs to be answered by industry and where each industry has had a history of machine learning in their decisioning. Um, you know, you look at specialty uh, insurance, what's going on in actuarial science uh, and, and the confluence between machine learning and actuarial science is really interesting and long. <laughs> And, and then you, when you look into other industries like uh, lending or you know, the uh, public sector, uh, there also have been a long history of, of using the uh, technologies together to do certain kinds of things. But um, I don't think it could be answered from a vendor point of view. I really think it needs to be answered from an industry point of view and just look at the state of their decisioning already as they're making investments in um, you know, their, their cultural change, their uh, digital transformation programs and things like that. So I think that's really the better way to answer that question. Yes, and we heard earlier today just from some of the other presenters about this idea of rules and machine learning together? And is this something that it's not like they're converging from a technology standpoint, but that they're becoming very closely tied to each other in, in that, you know, in the future, maybe we're not even going to be thinking about decisions without also be thinking in some way about machine learning. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And what I think what's surprising to me is how advanced some customers already are. You know, and some industries completely independently have decided strategically to mash up technologies for a while. Um, but there's a much larger group that just haven't done that, um, but they're on their digital transformation journey. Um, and I think it's interesting that now that 
the economy, at least in the US, uh, has changed. Um, those digital transformation programs are becoming more important than ever. Um, so uh, now is the time, folks. <laughs> well, they're definitely becoming more important. It's just, in, yeah. you know, I, I gave a presentation last week at a conference where I talked about the automation imperative. And it said, well, we have all these new technologies, so it makes it possible to do so much more. But at the same time, all your competition is also using those same technologies and methodologies so you have to look at them or else you're just not going to be competitive you're not going to survive so there's right. there, there's right. really a driver here from serving your customers but also just staying alive in the market yeah uh, every customer counts or every opportunity and so you companies cannot afford to lose someone on a self-service experience. They can't afford to lose mm -hmm. someone that's on a phone call. So how do you make every one of those conversations count? Right. That I think everyone's thinking that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, Jacob, did you have any other um, any other questions? I didn't, uh, I'm not seeing anything in, in Slack and didn't know if you had anything specific mm -hmm. just as a follow on to your question. No. We already uh, nine hours almost. I know, I know, it's amazing. Everybody now, tried. Yeah, we are supposed to have one last speaker joining us from Australia, but I have not.